people that's a good match for their abilities. Uh, so again, it allows them through making informed choice about the decisions of their vocational goal, about what vocational goal they like to pursue and the services and, pro and the services that they would like um, to help them achieve their goal as well as the provider of those services. Next slide. So who does DVR serve? DVR believes everyone should have the opportunity to pursue meaningful employment. Um, and that employment furthers a person's ability to live independently, make informed choices and contribute to one's community. DVR provides people with disabilities the tools, supports and services required to achieve successful employment, which hopefully results in greater quality of life. DVR may serve the individual when they have physical, mental or sensory disability that makes it difficult to get or keep a job that matches their skills, potential and interests. They need services and support such as counseling, training, or assistance with a job search in order to keep, get, keep, or advance in a job and are capable of working as a result of receiving DVR services. Next slide. What is an order of selection? An order of selection is required by federal law when DVR does not have sufficient resources to serve all eligible customers. It is how DVR prioritizes services for people who need them the most. DVR in Washington has been an order of selection since November 1st of 2017. Next slide. Who, do you, who does DVR serve in an order of selection? Our core mission is to serve individuals with the most significant disabilities and students with disabilities. DVR serves people with the most significant disabilities in priority category one first. Our next slide. Um, what happens to people placed on the waiting list? Currently, only open priority of service categories are priority of service category one, most significant disability, and priority of service category two, significant disability. When priority category three opens, customers will be served based on their date of application. The earlier the application in that priority category, the earlier they will be served when open. Waitlist customers will receive information and referral about other federal or state programs that offer services to assist with employment needs if available. Information and referral is only a service available to those on the waitlist. Otherwise known as they have to be, wait to be served. Next slide. What does information serve? Information and referral mean? Well, we're helping them again to explore other programs and services that are available if on the wait list. Um, the staff will contact them periodically to identify any changes that they may have to their disability status um, that may require like a reevaluation of the priority of service category that they're in. And again, they look at changes in circumstance that affect their ability to participate in VR services, such as if there's updates needed to things like contact information, if they're continuing to be available, um, their availability to receive our services. You know, if there's a couple of years that they may have been on the wait list, things may have changed since then. So we wanna know if they're still available and their continued interest in receiving VR services. Um, next slide. So what are the kinds of services available through DVR? Well, there's a multiple services. We provide individualized vocational rehabilitation counseling and, and employment services and support people with disabilities who want to work but face substantial barriers to finding meaningful and sustained employment. We, we also provide technical assistance and training to businesses regarding the regarding the recruiting and hiring of people with disabilities. Services, again, are individualized and provided to assist you to achieve your employment goal in your individualized plan for employment. Some examples of services are listed here are counseling and guidance um, by the Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor. We also have counselors for deaf and hard of hearing. Um, we have independent living services available to help an individual learn how to manage their disability issues that may get in the way, um, such as like learning to use public transportation, learning independent living skill development to assist them again with living independently. 
assistive technology devices may be needed to assist individuals. So just hearing aids, vision aids, or computer devices. Some examples that we have training and education available to help individuals to learn work skills and gain the qualifications needed to enter a job. And we have job related services to help individuals prepare and secure a job, including assistance with completing applications, conducting job search, mastering specific skills for the job so that they can maintain their employment. Next slide. This slide is just to give you a visual of what we're going to go into on the next couple of slides. Um, the, as far as the vocational rehabilitation process. So the first slide is the application. Next slide, please. DVR will provide information about vocational rehabilitation services. An application must be completed before the individual services begin. Next slide. An individual is eligible for DVR again if they have a physical or mental sensory impairment that makes it difficult for them to get or keep a, keep a job and need help finding one that matches their skills, abilities, and interests. And they need services and support, such as the training and assistance with finding and keeping a job. And they are capable of working as a result. Eligibility and time frame. A vocational rehabilitation counselor has up to 60 days to collect and review the records that document the person's identity, um, disability, and work status. If there's not enough information, we can send someone for uh, evaluation if they have no other resources to be able to pay for assessments. We do that as part of determining eligibility. Next slide. Eligibility determination and priority for services. The VRC will evaluate the individual's disability related limitations, anticipate a number of needed services, and whether they require multiple VR services over an extended period of time. Criteria will be used to assign the eligible customers to one of the five priority categories based on the severity of their disability. Priority categories ensure that DVR services services are prioritized for individuals with the most significant disabilities first. Next slide. Here are the five priority categories for which I'll be going into uh, more detail. So we can move to the next slide. Um, but first we're gonna say, look at what are the disability related functional limitations when looking at those priority of categories for services. The, the customer must look at seven distinct uh, functional limitation areas to be able to determine um, priority of services category. So they look at things from their person's mobility, um, which is the ability to move about from place to place inside and outside of their home compared to people who don't have mobility limitations. They look at things like work tolerance category, which is the ability to meet the typical demands and working conditions of a job the person's ability to communicate effectively or exchange information through expressive or receptive methods, spoken words, or concepts. Uh, communication limitations often require use of interpreter or assistive technology devices to facilitate communication. They also look at the area of self-care, which is the ability to independently perform activities of daily living at levels which allow the individual to participate in work. Individual experiencing a functional loss in self-care often requires personal assistance from another individual to accomplish routine, personal care, bathing, use in a bathroom, dressing, meals, medications, et cetera. Cognition and learning is another area that they look at, which is the ability to independently plan, initiate, learn, problem solve, and organize activities related to self-health, safety, socialization, recreation, and work. And lastly, they look at the um, area of work skills, which is an individual's ability to perform tasks required to carry out job functions. So when considering each functional loss, the VR counselor determines whether the functional loss is the result from a, from a disability is present, that the loss presents a barrier to the employment, and the functional loss meets the definition of a serious limitation 
and the individual required substantial VR services or intervention in the individualized plan for employment to address the limitations and achievement of, of to achieve employment. Um, only one serious functional limitation in a loss category has to be checked to have that loss be present in that category. So now we're going to go into the categories. Next slide. Um, Katie, Katie, we have a question about okay. whether SUD is considered um, a disability. Yes, uh, we do look. Okay, we do. Sorry. We do look at substance use disorder in terms of its impact on abilities of person to gain and maintain employment. Um, does that does that answer the question? I apologize. I'm not seeing well, it. I'm looking any. at the. Uh, I, I see it says thanks and thank you. So evidently, yes, you answered the question. Good, thank you. Yeah, it was just a simple yes or no. Okay, great. Um, so yes, we do. Um, so category one, which is uh, individuals with most significant disabilities. So in this category, they're requiring multiple VR services over an extended period of time and they experience uh, four or more functional loss areas. Next slide. Category two is an individual with significant disabilities that are requiring multiple VR services over an extended period of time, and they experience functional limitations in at least three functional loss areas. Next slide. Category three, again, significant disabilities require multiple VR services over an extended period of time, and they experience limitations in only two areas. And then category four um, requires multiple VR services over an extended period of time, and they experience functional limitations in one area. And then next slide, category five, not significantly disabled, um, no extended duration of services is necessary, and they do not require multiple VR services, but they experience functional limitations in one or more areas. And then the next slide sums up uh, about us remaining order of selection and showing you that priority categories one and two are continuously open, so those individuals are receiving services often. And then ca category three, we had no releases from this category in January. Um, at the bottom of the slide, there's a link to the DVR website. So you can check back regularly to see when category three opens up. Um, but what will happen is they will remove from those that had the oldest application date in category three and will work their way through all of category three before they move on to category four and so on. Um, next slide. So going, thinking again along the lines of that picture that I showed you earlier uh, of the vocational rehabilitation process, we move from application and eligibility to vocational assessment. If the customer is an open category, then they move to the vocational assessment phase. This is where a comprehensive assessment is completed by the VR counselor and customer to determine a job goal that best matches the individual's skills, abilities, interests, and informed choice. And includes looking at things like a person's work history, paid and unpaid, analyzing the label, labor market with them to see what kinds of occupations are a good match, uh, looking at a person's capabilities and aptitudes. They may be doing things like community-based assessment where they're getting to try out the, a, a job and assessing how they do at work. Um, and it's looking at disability related factors for the person, social supports, educational attainment, occupational skill levels, family and financial situation, emotional and physical health, support service needs, assistive technology needs, all that stuff is evaluated during the vocational assessment. Next slide. Then we move into the Individualized Plan for Employment, or IPE. It's a customer-driven process. Um, 
Within the first 90 days after eligibility, they may write their own plan or utilize other resources to assist them or work with the VRC. The VRC though has to agree to the plan and services and providers of those services. So again, there's informed decision-making that's occurring as to what services are necessary to achieve the goal and who those providers of those services will be. DVR is required to use least cost and comparable resources when available. It must include the three components of uh, having the vocational goal, the appropriate steps to achieve the goal, and the appropriate individualized combination of services for the customer to achieve the goal. Next slide. Katie, we have a question about yes. why are our categories three through five closed? Is it because Correct. of staffing lim limitations? Or yes. Yes, sorry to cut you off. It is, right now it's a capacity. So as with a lot of things that during these times that you may hear staff, we have to have enough the staff to be able to serve. So capacity is the issue, um, but that'll be continuously evaluated in terms of, you know, that um, they'll be monitoring and looking at when those release from category three can take place. Thank you. Sure. And so once we have done the plan for employment, we move into receiving the services that they need to achieve their employment outcomes. So once they're employed, DVR keeps their case open for at least 90 days to ensure the job is a good match. Cases are closed after 90 days of successful employment and when no other services are needed. Um, next slide. Post-employment services can be provided after a case is closed successfully rehabilitated when needed by the individual to maintain, regain, or advance in competitive integrated employment. Post-employment services are short-term services. So if someone, uh, in instances where they may need extensive retraining, um, these are not the services that they would receive. That would be looking at a new application for services. So if it's not something to do related to their previous plan where it's a short-term need, then we would look at having them reapply for services. Um, next slide. So now I'd like you to take you into the uh, supported employment services flow. Supported employment services uh, through DVR is competitive integrated employment, including customized employment for individuals with the most significant disabilities. It's time limited support services. So things like intensive training services on the job site or offsite job support services that are provided by DVR and having them to transition to their extended services. So not only the intensive services that are needed by DVR, then it's that, that they require that long-term support services are provided to help them maintain the employment over time. So they transition to a source other than DVR for those long-term supports. So in DVR, supported employment is for individuals with the most significant disabilities, including youth with the most significant disabilities who um, competitive integrated employment has not historically occurred or for whom competitive integrated employment has been interrupted or intermittent due to their, their disability and for who, because of the nature and severity of their disabilities need, again, the intensive support employment services and extended services after transition from support provided by DVR in order to perform the job. Next slide. And I yeah. just wanted to, to, to kind of um, underline what you just said, Katie, yes. because I think I think uh, we as IPS providers define supported employment a little differently. And, and so I wanted to make sure that everybody picked up on the fact that supported employment for DVR for the folks with the most significant disabilities um, and that it requires some long-term supports. Um, so it differs a little bit when, when we say supported employment, I think we're referring to it in a more general way. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So eligibility for supported employment through DVR is determined by the counselor. Termination is based on a comprehensive 
assessment of the individual's needs, BR needs prior to the development of their plan. And again, it's looking at that they need those, uh, that they require those intensive time limited support services from DVR after job placement to maintain the, the employment and then the extended services that they'll need for the long-term supports to achieve the employment outcome. Uh, next slide. So the comprehensive assessment the VR counselor conducts a comprehensive assessment of the need for support and employment prior to the IPE development. So in this, they're doing things that include but are not limited to. Um, they're reviewing the information and documentation utilized during eligibility determination process, information on the customers functioning with family care providers, treatment providers, teachers, um, how they're doing, how, a CBA perhaps or a community-based assessment if they've completed one through a community rehabilitation provider. So they're looking at those reports of how that um, job experience had gone for the individual. They may be looking at if it's somebody who's returning to DVR, they may be looking at job placement service reports that the customers had in the past, things that will help them as they move towards a new goal. Um, they may look at things like independent living service reports. They provide benefits planning to assess and understand the impact of benefits um, on working. Uh, and documentation, they look at their previous case if they've had one again to see what kinds of things can help them with their current situation. Um, assessment includes looking at their primary vocational factors like what kind of social supports they have and the needs assistive technology needs. They verify, again, that supported employment is appropriate, and they confirm the funding for the extended services or that natural supports will be developed. Help the customer determine the employment goal on the IP and help the client, or help the customer determine what services are needed to support the goal. And so next slide. As you'll see, this slide is much like the previous one. It's it's helping them not only select the goal, writing the plan, and um, coming up with those individualized services, but it includes on it in a supported employment plan those time limited supports that are provided through through DVR, and it includes um, the maximum amount of hours that a person is looking at wanting to work, and that their goal is in an integrated setting, and who the extended services are going to be provided through or long-term supports, that's all documented on the support, on a supported employment IPE as well. Next slide. So with the supported employment job placement, they're getting assistance with all aspects of the job placement. It must be a suitable match for the customer's skills, interests, abilities, informed choice, and be again, the number of hours the customer is capable of working. Once the job is obtained, intensive uh, training services begin and are provided until the job is stabilized. Uh, the CRP or Community Rehabilitation Program provides intensive individualized one-on-one -on -one job skills training and support provided at the supported employment job site to enable the DVR customer to obtain uh, on-the-job performance or to perform to the employer's expected level of job performance with job supports meet the expected level of job productivity and transition to the long-term extended services provided by an entity other than DVR. So next slide. So the extended services, once the job stabilization occurs, the customer transitions to long-term supports for extended services. And next slide, DVR cases less is left open for at least 90 days post stabilization. And case closure in collaboration with the customer community rehabilitation program and employer, all agree that the customer is doing well on the job to ensure the supported employment outcome is successful. So Katie, I, I, I see a comment here. It says, we as a CRP have been given uh, service delivery outcome plans. Um, for ITS for clients who do not have long-term supports in place. That is, they hope they can qualify for the FCS program, but they don't currently, currently have eligibility for that. Uh, shouldn't that be in place before the, 
ITS or the IPE has started? Yes, we, we do, um, unless there's reasonable belief that they are going to become eligible. So if we, the, cust, the, the counselor generally, you know, we do want to identify those extended service providers up front, but there are times where we can support the goal and they're involved with the program and they may per proceed forward with the belief that those services are gonna become available. Okay. And there's okay. that potential that they can develop natural supports. So we always wanna look at that and say, okay, that's not usually how we like it done, but if they had, um, and I don't have the wording exactly correctly, but there is this ability that they can write in the plan up front. We believe that this is going to become available um, for the individual. Uh, so I hope Excellent. that. There's also a question, what is informed choice by the client? Informed choice is a process through which the counselor uh, talks with the client about the options that are available, the providers that are available through DVR, and um, can give them information in terms of, you know, uh, like for instance, if it was looking at a, a provider, if someone was working with the FCS behavioral health provider, for example, and um, they came and they were referred from a behavioral health provider, we still offer informed choice of providers, but we do wanna make sure they understand that with their behavioral health services, a lot of times, for example, they're receiving a wraparound type support of, of provision of services. So we try to give them the understanding of what are all the services you're getting? Um, we wanna make sure that you stay connected because part of our program requires you to have those ongoing supports, for example, and we know those ongoing supports are going to continue to be provided through your current program. So we would give them the informed choice to understand while we have all these different providers, this is what we know about your um, behavioral health agency support employment program, for example, and how they're providing you wraparound. Or another example would be that we want to make sure that if you have a list, we have a list of all our CRPs, we would want to make sure they understand like what kinds of jobs those CRPs look for if we know like where they've had success in placing people, who's had some recent successes placing people and so that they know that how providers are doing. Are those some examples that help? I think so. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Looks like we're caught up for the moment. Okay, and then my last slide is about post-employment. As I shared with you before, post-employment services are available and they're provided as time-limited support services in um, supported employment. So the individual generally needs specific services to keep for advance in their job and it's beyond the support employment level of support available. So what I mean by that, it's these are services that are generally not provided through that comparable resources through what the, like the FCS program could provide, then they would work with DVR. So for example, someone generally is working on keeping their job perhaps when they come back, but they have got the ongoing coaching that's helping them with their current job tasks well, if new tasks are added to their job and it's going to take the job coach extra time to train them in those new tasks, for example, then we would look at intensive training services because that's not something that's currently available to them with the, the hours and support that they currently are allotted, if that makes sense. Or a person needs like, um, maybe they come back because they need something specific to the job that they're working. Um, or they needed assistive technology or things, again, that aren't readily available. They would work with their previous DVR case under post-employment services to look at what those needs are. But again, if those needs are longer term service needs, like they're looking at a whole new job goal, um, we would have them apply for services and start a new case because that's gonna take a longer term to look at um, vocationally, what's a good fit for them, and what are the training services that they may need to obtain their goal, and stuff such as that. 
So Katie, I did see a follow-up question. Is informed choice a form of agreement or compliance? Well, we're looking at agreement. We want to have people agree, like in terms of like, I don't think of it as a compliance thing. I think of it as being able to give people all the information available on something and helping them to make a decision that works, that I guess in some ways works within what we can approve. But um, yeah, I don't, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't. No, that makes sense. Absolutely. And did I hear you say this is your last slide, Katie? Yes. Okay, so then we're opening it up for questions at this point in time. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, so I'm actually gonna start out with a couple of them. Uh, <laughs> one is, is you had talked about referrals uh, earlier on that, that folks are on the waiting list. You would, would uh, that be our counselors. Uh, VRCs would end up making referrals to services. Can you speak a little bit to what that looks like related to foundational community supports and referring to FCS? In terms of referring to their local offices and helping them connect with their offices? Well, I know you and I talked yesterday about the fact that um, a VRC would be more likely to refer to a MARA group than they would to a specific foundational community supports provider. Yes, if they, if they are aware of a CRP that is um, serving the customer, if they are a, an FCS provider that is also a community rehabilitation program, they may refer them to that community rehabilitation program if that's what the customer is expressing that they want employment now or and they know that they're also an FCS provider. But if they don't know, um, they refer them to Amerigroup too. Okay help them get connected with FCS services as appropriate. So it, again, it's, it's about talking with the customer about what services, um, other resources we can provide them, right? In terms of mm -hmm. information, if they are waitlisted for services or. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Um, and then uh, I know that benefits planning is one of the services available through DVR. Um, could you speak a little bit more about when that happens, um, you know, what the process is and that kind of thing? Who, who yes, to yes um, that process happens when someone's been, um, they are eligible for DVR services and generally happens during that vocational assessment time where they're looking at, you know, the vocational goal, what are their benefits that they're receiving, um, you know, in terms of what are they looking to earn, what are they, uh, what kind of medical? So again, that's kind of up at the beginning of the process. We wanna make sure that someone um, has that early on so that decisions can be made about their vocational goal and the services. And that's through a benefits planning technician and their ref who's been certified to do benefits planning through the, so the vocational rehabilitation counselor makes the referral to the benefits technician. Mm -hmm. Um, with the individual's consent, you know, they gather information from Social Security, the technician does, and then they're able to give them an individualized session where they go over the report that they receive back um, on their specific situation. Mm -hmm. And that may also include helping them to understand about their DSHS benefits as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, question here, it says, if DVR places 90 calendar days retention, uh, then is the case open another 90 days for post-retention services? Um, the, that's in terms of that they do 90 days retention and then they open it up for post-employment. Um, I will get back to you on that in terms of how the post-employment services, my understanding, you know, I'm more about the 90 days but then when we do our post-employment, those are short-term services. So we're usually under support employment. We're usually helping people stabilize, you know, re-stabilize within their existing job. But yes, okay. I will get more information. That sounds great. And since we're going to send the recording out and the slides to everyone, we'll also, if, if there are other questions that um, aren't answered today, we can surely uh, include the answers in the email that we send out along with the slides and the recording. That's great, thank you. 
So there's a question here. What's the best way to refer someone to VR from a supported employment program? The best way to refer someone would be for one, um, depending on your location, would be know what office to connect with. And again, if you're new to providing services to vocational rehabilitation, you can contact um, myself, which my information is included in this presentation, and I can help connect you with your local DVR office supervisor, and then they can help connect you with their local liaison that they have. I apologize, I got bumped out for just a moment. <laughs> yeah, more technical difficulties. <laughs> um, so, and I don't know if you ended up seeing while I was out for the moment, there's a question related to um, whether you can provide some information about what DVR self-employment option looks like for working with people that want to become self-employed. I can definitely, I'll provide information on that, but it's going through that same initial process in terms of eligibility determination and prioritization for services. And then it's working with the counselor under vocational assessment to talk about a vocational goal. And again, the steps and services needed to achieve that. And then we have specific steps that the counselor will do to help the individual assess self-employment as an option. So that is an option Not some people do self-employment with DVR. And I could provide further information on that as well. Mm -hmm. What percentage of individuals do you think um, opt for self-employment? I'm guessing it's a fairly <laughs> small number. I, I'm guessing too, actually, Don. I don't have okay. the All percentage. Right. But. Yeah, not a problem. And, and then another question, and hopefully it's been answered. How do you make a referral for DVR? Yeah. So again, that office locator is a great place to go. I mean, you're always welcome to contact me and I can give you the the office contact information as well, but I mean, it's you can go on to our website um, and get that contact information. Well, and then I will just bring up, Katie and I have been talking about the fact like every other business, there has been turnover in DVR. So there are, are quite a number of new employees in various offices. And um, I know that I've talked to some of the folks from FCS agencies about uh, building a relationship with DVR counselors or the DVR supervisor so that they are aware of you, so that they know what it is that you provide. Um, and Katie, could you talk a little bit more about that? I know we're, we're talking about doing training with various DVR offices and putting something together um, so that they have that to refer to, but could you, could you address that a little bit too, please? Yes, I know when we've done some reviews and got, and I've actually met with the um, new providers, foundational community support providers. That's one thing they, we often talk about is the importance of that relationship. I know it's important to the FCS fidelity um, as well in terms of the relationship with vocational rehabilitation. And I can't s stress enough the um, connection with your local supervisor is a great way to get started. A lot of times our supervisors you know, they will first talk with you, um, the program manager or company, and then they can schedule time um, to meet with you or to connect you with their liaison or connect you with their office in order to be able to talk about your services that are available. Um, so that really is an important connection. So mm -hmm. that people know about, again, we also want to know about what resources are out there. So that way, when we have individuals that maybe aren't currently being served because they're on the wait list for services that we know there are potential other programs that may be able to serve them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I see there's a question that says, what supports are provided for independent living skills from DVR? So for independent living skills, there could be things like um, 
travel training. Um, we provide question about what we're doing under independent living schools. A number of things in terms of helping people to live independently, like money management. Um, I, I know I made some notes earlier about different things that we do under independent living skills. Um, I, it's again, let me make sure to get you a list of, you know, more information about exactly what we provide under the living independent living skills. That sounds like a great idea. It would certainly work. Um, Let's see here. Uh, another question about what role does the referring caseworker or employee have in the DVR process? What should uh, our level of involvement be? The DVR counselor takes the lead role, I think, for their client. When they're working with the individual client, they're going to work with them to see what services they're currently getting or what services they're interested in accessing and seeing how they fit with their individualized plan with DVR. So they are going to take the lead role in terms of referring to um, giving them whatever the information and referral services that are available to them, mm -hmm. um, if that helps. Well, and I think what the, the person is referring to here, and, and you can correct, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. Um, so if Sarah was the person to refer to DVR, what is her role? Oh, well, her role is uh, can be to help the client get connected. And, you know, the client is allowed to have um, support at their appointment. So they can be there as a, a person to inform the process with the individual to be a support for them, as well as if they have information that will assist the counselor and individual through their VR process. So any, um, you know, when a consent for information is exchanged under that application for services, if there's information about their disability or employment history or things that can help the counselor to, um, again, have that sufficient information to determine eligibility is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that's, in my mind at least, that's part of where that building of a relationship comes in because you build the relationship with the supervisor, but you also do with the counselors so that if you have someone new coming up that needs to be referred to DVR, um, you can kind of uh, provide um, just a heads up to the counselor that there's somebody uh, being referred from you so that, that uh, they're alerted to the fact that you might also be involved in kind of what's going on there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. And they might not. Have... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say with that ongoing relationship with your counselor is a, is a great place, like you're saying, that you could talk about those referrals in terms of you know, if you're stuck on something, sometimes the counselors have great ideas for mm -hmm. um, jobs that are available, or again, they're real experts in understanding a person's disability and how it's impact, you know, how certain vocations might be a good match for them. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So, so they're a great resource for that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, when you say expert, they are in fact that. I, I, uh, um, I, I don't know that I've mentioned, it, well, I haven't mentioned to this particular group, I worked for a behavioral health agency for 21 years in the supported employment program. We were a community rehab uh, uh, program. We were also a ticket to work employment network for a period of time. Um, and in, in working with DVR, um, particularly one of the counselors became a great resource for us when we were kind of stumped about various things. Um, you know, obviously, uh, if a person needed DVR services, we referred them to DVR, but on, on occasions when someone wasn't referred and, and I was just stuck about something, I would uh, talk with Kathy, who was one of the DVR counselors in, in Moses Lake, um, and she provided marvelous information and ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very definitely a great resource. Um, Christina asked, and I'm, I'm sure this is referring back to independent living, how about budgeting? Yes, the money management piece, they can help with the budgeting. Thank you for helping with that idea, because yes, helping them with budget, that's, that's a great, a, a great example. Mm -hmm. So Paul says, are DVR counselors aware that a DVR client can also be in the FCS program with support employment at the same time working on different items? Um, we had that conversation yesterday, Katie. Yes, and we do, we have, do, and I think, Don, you had some great examples. 
mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. people working, uh, still receiving DVR services, but weren't supported employment. Mm-hmm. Because again, we talked about how some individuals don't require that ongoing right. uh, job coaching, but still are receiving services through DVR. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a that's another difference, if you will, between DVR and perhaps some of the folks that we see through the FCS program is um, level of need. Um, you know, I, especially DVR right now with uh, order of selection is really serving the individuals that have the greatest needs. And on occasion, some of the folks getting FCS services just are not at that same level. They, they don't have the same need. They, they aren't going to require long-term and extended job coaching in order to um, be able to function in their job. So um, I do know as a provider, uh, once upon a time, that there were occasions when a person would be referred to a DVR CRP because they were open with DVR and also end up being open with foundational community supports. And um, had heard from someone somewhere in the process that they were going to have to close with the FCS provider. Um, and so uh, I see, can you explain, please explain acronyms? Absolutely. Sorry about that. Foundational community supports providers um, being one of the acronyms I was just using. Um, the individual would end up being confused. And so that's another good reason to have a good relationship with the DVR counselors as if somebody's being referred to a CRP, but they're also open with you as a foundational community supports provider. Um, They can help the person navigate. Are you gonna continue to work with both agencies? Um, Are you gonna just work with the CRP? Um, And then that community rehab program. Um, And I will say too, related to community rehabilitation programs, Katie, Katie and I were discussing yesterday um, there are foundational community supports agencies that might be interested in becoming a, a CRP. Their DVR is not currently open to accepting applications for that, but they do open that, that option periodically. So if you have any interest in becoming a community rehab uh, provider, maybe Katie, could you address a little bit what that would mean? To become a community rehabilitation provider yeah. with DVR? What do, they, what do they provide? What does it look like? <sighs> We provide the full gamut of services um, in terms of like our CRPs in terms of the job placement and re- to retention to assessment of it. Uh, they provide assessment, job placement, job retention, training services on the job site. They provide services off site mm-hmm. for job support. Mm-hmm. We have uh, CRPs that also provide independent living services like we were talking about. Um, they, some do both. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have, um, I'm trying to think of what other services. So we, they can do trial work experiences for DVR too, if we have concerns about a person's ability to work. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, due to their disability, the severity of their disability, they can uh, do that. Um, I mean, they're specific like anything else, like any other requirements, like with the FCS program, there's specific contract requirements to be able to be a provider, but mm-hmm. there's a lot of, um, helpful services that CRPs provide. Absolutely. And and I, I mentioned that the behavioral health agency that I work for, we, we were a community rehab program. One of the requirements for that is a, a certification process. In the case of behavioral health agency, it comes with that. It can come with your behavioral health licensing. But for those agencies that aren't a, a behavioral health agency, um, obtaining certification through CARF. And um, I don't remember what CARF stands for, Katie. <laughs> My mind's just gone blank. Um, uh, yeah. Um, evidently yours too. So CARF yeah. is an agency <laughs> I, that I was, does certify, uh, ag- uh, certify other agencies to, to uh, be uh, eligible to um, uh, provide certain services. Uh, right. It's a pretty convoluted and extensive process to go through CARF certification. In fact, we've got a, a webinar coming up on that. Um, I don't remember which nice. month, March, April, something along that line. So stay tuned for that. Um, but consider if, if you're interested, the idea of becoming a community rehab program when DVR opens up that option once again. And I'm sure if you have additional questions about that, you could reach out to Katie. Um, 
please do reach out to me. And I can also put you in touch with our community programs manager mm, to nice. explain more about community rehabilitation programs and the services that they provide mm -hmm. to their customers. Mm -hmm. I honestly, while you were asking me about CARF, I was looking at our service delivery outcome plan for IL skills training to see the list of skills training goals, hmm. oh, good. topics, and we have 12 of them. And so we have you, uh, training that helps around use of transportation services, decision-making, money management, use of communication access services, organizational abilities, interpersonal and social relationships, time management, self-advocacy, accessing community resources and benefits, attendance management, self-care, and self-protection are all uh, topics that individuals can receive training in. Very nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I do wanna mention too, while I'm thinking about it, um, related to the question about uh, someone who would be open with foundational community supports and a community rehab program. Um, DVR and Medicaid both say they are payers of last resort. So you cannot bill both systems for the same service. So in other words, if somebody is open with a community rehab program by, by default, they're going to be helping them find a job. And so that job search piece of things can't be done by the FCS provider at the time that they're open with DVR. Um, so it's a it's a it's a balancing act. There may be other things that an FCS provider could do, um, but doing that job search piece of, piece of things will be done by the community rehab provider, unless the person then opts not to be not to have their case open with DVR. So um, you know that that's kind of if they applied to DVR, they want a case open with DVR. So um, it's a it's a dance all the way around, and if you run into difficulties, kind of being able to move through that scenario, um, you know, contact one of us so that we can talk it through and, and kind of figure out, um, you know, where the person stands with all of that, if that makes sense. Um, I see Megan has asked, does DVR cover community-based assessments? Um, and I'm not sure, Megan, if you're talking about, you know, funding of that. Um, and Katie, I'll, I, if that's the case, I'll turn it over to you. If if a person is a community rehabilit, if I'm sorry, a person, if an agency is a community rehabilitation program with DVR, we can do a community based assessment. So again, if they're not receiving that service and they're a community rehabilitation program with DVR, and the person is an individual is looking at an individualized plan for employment with their counselor. A lot of times that's done during vocational assessment. It can't be done at any point in the rehabilitation process in terms of for DVR, community-based assessments are used to help determine the vocational goal and the steps and services to achieve the goal. And sometimes somebody will be in a plan and actually need a community, need, need to look at you know, a change of direction so they can be performed at any point. So if a person, again, is receiving services through DVR and the CRP, or excuse me, no acronyms, right? Community-based or community rehabilitation program, if you are a community rehabilitation program, often that is community-based assessments with DVR. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so if it really is coming back to Megan, you know, does DVR pay for that? Yes, they do, but only if you are the community rehabilitation program providing the service. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Um, what do offsite training services look like? Those are services that are approved um, through DVR. They are specific to when an agency has a, a, a mental health, uh, a person with mental health credentials is providing that, um, or they can be a certified rehabilitation counselor, but they're providing the offsite like coaching. Um, related to interpersonal challenges, so offsite job support services. Um, and that's usually that's when someone usually doesn't disclose their disability to an employer um, that we're doing those offsite services. And mm -hmm. yeah, I was actually really tickled. It, it was added within recent years. I think I was still working for the behavioral health agency when it was added, because we do have a lot of folks that will at least initially say, I don't want you to disclose to my employer, but we know they need assistance. 
And, and so that assistance ends up then being able to be provided offsite and talking through, you know, how the day go, any challenges with folks, um, yeah. how did you handle that? Shall we role play? I mean, various things that could look like that and a variety of other things. Mm -hmm. Ah, Linda, Commission for Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities, I think, and I do believe you're right, CARF. Yes. <laughs> thank you for that. Yes, thank you, Linda. And I see Teresa said um, offsite trainings can be anything that the CRP does not train in house for such, for such, for such as extensive computer skills, forklift trainings, cashier training, certification for peer support, and so so forth. Um, yeah, I think um, a, for a community rehabilitation program. Once again, those, those offsite services are billable to DVR if an agency is a community re rehabilitation program. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Katie, they're, they're gonna be related to performance on the job. Yes, I, I was just gonna pull up, if it's okay with you, what it says on our service delivery Please outcome. Do. Plan. Please so do. if you could bear with me. And I also wanna double check, am I cutting into Tammy's time? I, I just wanna make sure that we're still Okay, with time. Well, let's see what we've got here. And I'm not sure how much time. Uh, it's 9.39 at this point in time. So is, is Tammy on? That's what I'm. Good morning, this is Tammy. Um, Katie, you're fine. Please go ahead. Um, my presentation should only take about um, 15 minutes. Okay, thanks, Excellent. Tammy. Okay, so then. Um, uh, so I, go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt you, Don. I was just going to say I have the list of what's covered, what kinds of things are covered under offsite um, job support. Excellent. So um, customers, they it says offsite job support services. If it's not supported, well, it occurs away from the DVR workplace to assist the customer in areas such as, but not limited to, adjusting and adapting to work environments and or the stresses of working, maintaining punctual work schedule and or adjusting to any changes in their schedule, positively accepting supervision and direction, maintaining positive interpersonal relationships and or communicating effectively with their supervisors, coworkers and others whom they must interact with in the workplace, recognizing and changing psychosocial behaviors they exhibit at their workplace that impede or compromise their job performance and their ability to interact with others, recognizing and addressing the escalation of anxiety and stress symptoms that impede or compromise their job performance, adjusting to other significant changes in lifestyle or personal circumstances that occur because of their employment. Excellent, thank you, Katie. Um, Welcome. I see your uh, question, what is the entry point slash person for application for DVR services or for foundational community support services, contact person and or website? Um, oh, I can paste the website for DVR because you'll want to contact your local DVR office. Excellent. And Thank that's, you. I will do that right now. Uh, let's see. Christina says, do we have an idea when providers will be going out into the field? <laughs> I, I'm laughing only because we would all so love to have the answer to that. <laughs> I, I need to see real people and not just on video one of these days. Um, I do know that uh, as a state employee, um, as a healthcare authority employee, um, they had talked about being back in the building and starting to, to do, uh, you know, the work schedule that allowed those people that wanted to be in the building in the building, and they had to push that off a little bit. So it's a moving target. Um, it, it's not one where there's a hard and fast date yet. And um, I, it just is mind boggling to me <laughs> that, that we've gone and to everybody else I know. Uh, this long with social distancing and that kind of thing. Who would, have, who would have ever thought? Oh my gosh. And I do see, Katie, thank you for putting that link in the chat box. Uh, appreciate that. All right. Yes. So I think we're actually just about right on time to hand it over to Tammy then. 
Um, thank you, Katie, for your part of the presentation. Very well done. I, I love the slides. I love the information. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It's nice getting to get, be here today. Absolutely. Appreciate it a great deal. So Tammy, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Um, now, did you have slides that you wanted to present? And are you going to, um, I can quit. I will actually, I think I already arbitrarily quit sharing my screen because I got bumped out. <laughs> Good morning, this is Tammy. Um, they were added to Katie's slides, but I can also share my screen. I have them up on my computer as well. So whatever's easiest. Okay. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and share your screen, that would be just fine. There we go. Can you see that okay? Wonderful. Yes. So good morning. My name is Tammy Doyle and I am the Transition Program Manager with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And I just want to say thank you um, for um, having me participate in your meeting today and to Katie for also inviting me. Um, I will be talking about pre-employment transition services um, because that seems to be a really hot topic and there's lots of questions um, surrounding it. What I'll do is I'll start out with um, just a basic overview of really what they are and where they came from um, and then talk about coordination and provide some resources to you as well. Um, as the transition program manager, uh, um, I do want to just say that tr transition is, is like a big puzzle and pre-employment transition services is really a small piece to that puzzle that really enhances um, services to students with disabilities while they're still in high school. Um, so pre-employment transition services, you'll often um, hear them referred to as pre-eds, um, are a product of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014. Really what this did is that it, is, it established a new emphasis on services to students with disabilities. So it increased the opportunities of services that are available and it expanded the population of youth that we are able to serve. Um, prior to WEOA, um, a lot of DVR's focus was just on students who were receiving special education services in high school. Um, now we have the ability to serve students um, over a much broader range. So that includes students who are receiving special education, who have a um, section 504 plan, which is just accommodations um, within a school setting, or students who have a documented diagnosis or disability, medically um, documented disability, but are not receiving special education or 504. Under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, like I said, it expanded services um, opportunities and also expanded um, the students that we are able to access and serve. It also required um, vocational agencies across the nation to set aside 15% of our annual funds. So when I, when I say we set aside 15% of our annual funds, this was not an addition to our budget. This, we had to use our existing budget to help support um, students with the provisions of pre-employment transition services. So as Katie had spoke earlier, um, when we are in order of selection, some of that was due to this new mandate. We had 100% of our, our general budget to serve you know, our clients, our existing and new coming clients. And then we had to, um, set aside a portion of that budget that we were used to operating on now just for pre-employment transition services. So as we're working through that process, we are able to um, at, um, take individuals off of you know, the wait list in those um, priority categories to now serve um, under VR general services. Under WEOA, like I said, we had to set aside um, a percentage of our general operating budget. We are also mandated to ensure that we are coordinating these pre-employment transition services with educational service with our schools. 
um, so with school districts and staff across the state. And then um, provide evidence of the extent to which pre ets have been made accessible and available. So um, each year, so we do quarterly reporting and then we also do annual reporting to the feds um, regarding our grant. And the whole purpose of this, again, is to ensure, ensure availability and accessibility of these services to students who need them across the state. And so what are pre-employment transition services? And I, know, I apologize, the screen is, is, um, has lots of words, um, but basically it's just a coordinated set of activities. We are working with the school districts to see what services they are already providing to their students within that school setting. Um, it is, they are intended to promote movement from school to employment. So with the early engagement with students, we're getting them work ready while they're in high school so that when they exit high school, then they are prepared to enter the working, um, the work field. Organized and um, in collaboration with school staff, I know I already said this, but this is so critical. Um, we, and again, we owe it, put an emphasis on that coordination between VR and schools. It was, um, it's been mandated since the Rehab Act of 1973, but this really is holding us accountable, making sure that we're working with our school partners to identify what services they're providing to their students under their high school and beyond plan, making sure these services align with their vocational goals that are identified in, in their high school and beyond plan and or um, their transition IEP. Um, so they are, yes. There is a question that says, does this include people over 18 that are working on getting their GED? Yeah, I and I'm going to I'm going to get to that. So um, I will talk about who are eligible for these services because we get a lot of questions about that. And so, um, if it's okay, can I um, absolutely answer that question in just a moment? Okay. Um, so pre-employment transition services are also intended to enhance and support secondary education planning. So we cannot replace what the school is already doing. Um, or supplant, um, we can only enhance. One example I can give you is, let's say a school is working, part of a high school and beyond plan is that they must have a resume completed before graduation. Um, their high school and beyond plan is a high school graduation requirement. So everything on that document is required to be completed as a contingency of getting their diploma. Um, resumes, completing a resume is a requirement of the high school and beyond plan. So pre-employment transition services would not be able to be brought into students to help them write a resume. But what we could do is we can bring in business professionals to talk to the students about what they look for in, in um, effective or, or great outstanding resumes. We can also work with students on how to communicate the information from their resume in like a 30 second infomercial. Um, we can also, you know, um, set, set up mock interview panels. So students have the ability to practice um, communicating and, and talking about their skill set to business professionals. But again, we would not be able to replace what is already required at the school. Um, so just to elaborate on that too, what we look at is um, when we're partnering with schools and providing pre-employment transition services. And I'll show you an example in just a moment. But we look at, is this something that is already customarily provided by the school? Um, do they have curriculum or staff that already provides that service? And that would already, that would be the school's responsibility. Are they getting funding to provide that service? Um, what that would, what that usually looks like is if there is um, money management written into a student's IEP, then we would not be able to come in and provide money management um, instruction. 
to fulfill that IEP goal. But what we could do is we can come in and enhance. So we could bring in junior achievement and they could provide workshops on extending their knowledge on financial literacy. And then um, we also look at if they are receiving an academic credit or um, fulfilling a graduation requirement. If they are completing this service, again, for and, and getting a credit or fulfilling a graduation requirement, that's the school's responsibility. We get a lot of um, calls and communication from schools wanting us to set up um, in school or during school work-based learning um, to fulfill their high school and beyond plan or their it's a 0.5 graduation requirement. That's the school's responsibility. They're getting either CTE funding, Department of Education funding, or um, IDEA, so special education funding, to provide that service to their student already. We can build on those experiences. So they have um, maybe a, an unpaid work-based learning going on during the school day. Um, and then we can set up a paid work-based learning that happens, takes place after school or on weekends. Again, um, pre-employment transition services are delivered in alignment with a student's IEP. So whatever their vocational goal is identified on their IEP, then those are the services that we help support, um, work in collaboration with the schools to help support. And we do take into account the student's skills, abilities, preferences, and interests. And we also take into consideration that their, um, you know, their goals change over time. High school and beyond plans start in eighth grade. And so maybe in eighth, eighth grade, their goal is to be a firefighter. And now um, it's changed. They, they have um, gained more experience or exposure to the working world and have found another interest. And that's okay. So we work to help support those changes in their preferences as well. Um, and this is important because we get lots of questions about this too. Um, as Katie had said, VR services are voluntary. Um, they are not mandated to be provided to all students with disabilities. Um, again, it is based on need. What is it they are not already getting through their school programs and how can we help support them to more successful life of employment after um, exiting high school? Um, they are not mandated. Um, so there's five pre categories and each student across the state with a disability is not mandated to receive all five of those services. Again, if they only need work-based learning, then we would help support them with work-based learning. Or if they only need self-advocacy, then we would support them in the area of self-advocacy. And, and also pre-employment transition services are required to take into consideration informed choice. Um, as Katie said, you know, this is about students. These are really student-centered services. Um, are they appropriate? Are they necessary? And are, are, are they wanted? Do this, does the student want to participate? Um, informed choice in, in um, the context of pre-employment transition services is filling out that consent form. By filling out a consent form, there is testing to yes, I'm voluntarily um, wanting to participate in these services. Um, so pre-employment transition services are focused on assisting students to identify career interests to be further explored. Um, pre-employment transition services are, they are intended to be delivered on a continuum. And so we want to help them explore their career pathways, make sure that they have the skills, the skill acquisition and skill set to be successful um, in the working world. And so typically what this looks like is it may start with job exploration. Um, we might look at some self-advocacy, understanding how to advocate um, for accommodations on the work site, um, mobility training, how are you going to get to that job? Um, it might be time management or organization. Um, it may be communication. 
And then typically we have work-based learning activities. So once they've identified a career that they'd like to further um, explore their, their career goals, we can do some job site tours, um, some, job, some job shadows, and then we would place them into a work-based learning. I, I can't stress enough how much I think that those job site tours and those job ex, um, shadow experiences are so important prior to that placement in a work-based learning. Um, I think about myself and even my kids when they first started the working world and the anxiety that they felt on that first day of the, the day of the job. You know, don't know what to wear. I don't know where um, to park. I don't know where to eat lunch. So there's so many questions, you know, leading up to the anxiety of that first day. If we can get them out on that job site for a tour to see, here are all the different um, um, locations around this business. Here is where each of these activities take place at this business. Um, and then the job shadow. This is exactly what you will be doing um, in a paid work-based learning. This is what's expected of you. This is how you dress. Um, these are communication expectations. So that when they do go out into that paid work-based learning, they have all of that information to help them be successful. We really truly, um, I think sometimes we do placements too early and we put, put our students out into a work-based learning and sometimes it's a terrible experience. And then they associate all work, working experiences with that one um, negative experience. So really, truly, again, it's intended to be a continuum building up to a paid work-based learning to help them be successful once they exit high school. Um, Pre-employment transition services are made available statewide to all students with disabilities who need them. Again, maybe there's some students who don't need that additional support. They're getting everything they need to their school program. Um, and here's the other exciting part. They do not need to be a DVR customer. They do not need to be on a caseload to receive those pre-employment transition services. Um, The five required pre-employment transition services include, like I was um, sharing with you, job exploration, work-based learning, post-secondary guidance and counseling. This can help with FAFSA or identifying colleges that um, can support their, their career interests, looking at um, what credentials might be needed for a specific job, and then work readiness and um, instruction and self-advocacy. And so this is um, getting to that question that was just asked. Um, who are eligible for pre-employment transition services? Um, they have to be a student. So they have to be currently in, enrolled and or attending um, secondary, which is high school, or post-secondary education. Um, when we talk about enrolled, um, this would be they've exited high school, they've been applied and accepted into post-secondary program, and so they are actively enrolled. Typically takes place between the summer of, of when they graduate and they're going on to post-secondary. They must be, um, so we, the age range is defined by the department, our state department of education. Typically in Washington state, um, we say, um, ages 16 through 21, uh, and how that is determined is the age in which students are required to have um, vocational planning included in their IEP. However, it can be as young as 14 if appropriate. And what that means is um, there are st students going to high school sometimes at the age of 14. Um, and maybe sometimes when they enter high school, those schools across the state put them directly on to include transition planning in their IEP. If it's appropriate, then we can absolutely start working with, with students as young as 14. Uh, but our state's Department of Education identifies transition planning 
um, requirement at the age of 16. We do require that students must be 16 to participate in work-based learning. And then when it says through that age of 21, that is up until their 22nd birthday. So as, as soon as they turn 22, they are no longer eligible for pre-employment transition services. And I know that there has been some recovery services through the Department of Education um, here in Washington State due to COVID and the loss of education um, or access to transition. So students are staying in past their 22nd birthday. That's temporary. It was, was not a change in law. So we are not able to change um, our requirements for pre ed either. Um, and then again, these are intended for students who, who with, with disabilities. So they must have um, an IEP, uh, a 504 plan, or a medically documented disability. And then um, my last slide is, I just wanted to share with you some resources. My contact information is here on the screen. We, when you go to the DVR website, and I gave you this website here as a reference, there is a section specifically for transition. So that will help um, students um, uh, um, identify their DVR counselor liaison. It will also help them identify who their regional transition consultant is. So the DVR counselor liaison is the person who would be working with students who need more intensive one-on-one -on -one support. And if a student needs that one-on-one -on -one job coaching, then they would go um, through the application and eligibility process, as Katie, Katie described, and then they can receive pre-employment transition services through their caseload. Um, <clears throat> these are intended to be group services. Again, we're eliminating that barrier to access. A consent form is the only thing that is required. And our regional transition consultants are the ones who work with the schools to coordinate the appropriate services. Uh, on our website also is access to a consent form to be able to participate in these services. And then we also have, <clears throat> excuse me, a video that is a basic overview of pre-employment transition services. It talks about the services and it also talks about the, um, the coordination process. The other thing I'll show you really quick that you can access on our website. This is our a statewide needs assessment. So this is when we are working with the schools to help coordinate those services. We can look at, <clears throat> excuse me. We ask the um, schools to take a voluntary um, survey. It's called the transition self-assessment um, survey or transition self-assessment tool. Um, and we can look at the availability, accessibility, and coordination of services of those five required pre-employment transition, transition service categories across the state. Um, we have this data at a building level, district level, regional level, and then also at the state level. So we can look at to what extent are these services being provided or available to all students. These are general education students. Because remember, um, students receiving special education are gen ed students first. So to what extent are services available to all students within a building? To what extent are services being accessed by students with disabilities? And then to what extent are those buildings working with DVR to help coordinate these services? We can also look at Within each one of those pre ed categories, we can look at authorized um, activities. So we can look and see where it is where there might be some get, gaps or deficits um, in services. And then that's how we help coordinate um, programming for their students in that building. That is the end of my presentation. Um, I am happy to take some questions. I do have another um, meeting that's starting in about five minutes, um, but I'm happy to take some questions or if you want to contact me, um, you have my information as well.
Thank you very much, Tammy. And I, I do think perhaps what we'll do is if there are additional questions, I will forward, the, forward them to you um, in order to send those out then when we send the recording link, the slides and and uh, that kind of thing. So um, I know we're, we're, we've uh, passed the end time for the, the webinar by just a little bit. And, and very honestly, I think that's because we had such marvelous questions that that goes exactly the way we would hope it would, because we had a lot of great questions. So um, if there are any additional questions for Tammy, please put them in the chat box. I will make sure that she gets them and then I will make sure that they get sent out um, when we send the, the slides and that kind of thing. Thank you so much, everyone, for your wonderful participation, for, for choosing to be here today. I'm sure you could have chosen to be elsewhere and here, here you are with us. So thank you so very much. Uh, once again, I'm Don Miller with the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery and I'll be sending out the information after the fact um, to you. Um, Katie, Tammy, any parting thoughts? Okay, all right, good deal. Thank you so very much. Have a good day.